Thanks for joining us for the Long Island Sound Podcast. Each week we explore new music and dive deeper with the artists and their stories behind the music. Please subscribe and rate and review us wherever you stream this podcast. Here's your host, Steve Yusko. You're going to get a real kick out of my guest today. Emmett Hughes has a real diverse catalog of original music. We had a lot of fun today. He gave us some really great insights on how he explores his muse. And I think you're going to be quite surprised at the variety of music you're about to hear. Let's check out his song, What Will I Do? What will I do when I don't know what to say to you anymore? What will I do when I don't care enough to come back to get what I'm waiting for? Empty hand that the water slips through And nothing new My love My love What will I do if I'm lost and can't get back to you all alone? What I'm searching for in the undertow Swirling waters bringing me down Fighting my way back to solid Take hold of me What will I do to save The precious moments Every day that slip away Welcome to the Long Island Sound Podcast. I'm so excited about today's interview with Emmett Hughes. I met Emmett Hughes at my friend's house, Mike Nugent, where I meet all my musicians, basically. 
and found out uh, later that Emmett is a singer-songwriter. I got to see uh, a video that Emmett did with Mike and a bunch of other people. We'll talk about that. But we're really going to get into Emmett's story. And uh, welcome to the Long Island Sound podcast, Emmett. Good to have you here. Yes, good to be here. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. Hey, I got to ask you this. How did how did you start playing music? How did it all begin for you? And was it early in life? You know, where, where did it begin for Emmett Hughes? It, early on, I took piano lessons. Uh, probably started at about seven or eight years old. And, oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, I did that until I was about 14 or 15. And then I got a guitar, and that was the end of piano for me. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> I started playing piano. I mean, I started playing guitar, sorry. Yeah, I, I took piano lessons as well, and then you get to that point where, hey, I can't lug this thing around, and there isn't right. always a piano, and this was before... Right, this is before portable keyboards. keyboards and stuff, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, did you grow up on Long Island or uh, other places? I grew up in Long Island, yes. Oh, okay, great, great. You know, so born in Brooklyn, but moved out here when I was maybe a year and a half old or something like that. Oh, nice. All right, so the memories of Brooklyn are, are sparse, if any, right? Right. <laughs> So how did you move from now playing the guitar to suddenly saying, hey, I think I can write some songs or I'd like to be a songwriter? Well, that started actually um, back in the 90s. I um, started an original band. Okay. And, what was it uh, called? It was called Voices. All right. We played around quite a bit. Um, and, um, and then I... I changed careers. I uh, I went back to school to become a chiropractor, and that kind of faded away. Right. And and then I was playing in cover bands for a while, and um, and then I decided, you know what, I'm tired of copying other people's music, and I felt like I had a lot to say, and so I started writing and recording, and uh, haven't looked back since. Nice. You know, it's amazing. And I actually learned this over the past year, how many doctors and professionals are musicians uh, as well. You know, in fact, my urologist, uh, Chris de Blasio is, I found out. Oh, he was a, I know you, Chris de Blasio. You know, Chris, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that son of a gun moved to Florida and he, I and, know, and, and he I up know. and left I, me the yeah, son of a, me too. <laughs> he's great, great guy, really nice bedside manner. And, and he yeah, left he's us. Terrific doctor. Yeah, so once once I told him about what I was doing, it like all of a sudden the conversation changed because we had a mutual interest, right. which is great. But I'm still pissed that oh, that's a bad pun. I'm still pissed off <laughs> that he moved to Florida. So when you listen to this, Chris, you you owe me a couple of checkups, and I'm not talking about the checkups that you know I don't like to have. But <laughs> 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 so you you had the voices, you're playing around uh, around town, so. You, you're earning your chops, I guess, out on the street. What was, what was your very first public performance? What was that like? Ooh, let me Ooh see. good question, huh? Yeah, good question. I think it probably was. I was still playing piano then. Okay. And my friend Laura, who actually sings on, uh, she does all the background vocals on my uh, recordings now. Mm. We've been friends since uh, junior high school. What's Laura's uh, last name? We got to give her a plug. Laura Press. Laura Press. All right, great. Yes. Formerly Laura Hayes when, I, when okay. we met, but now she's Laura Press. And um, um, we, I guess it was we did something on her front lawn. Oh. So I don't know how we did that. I guess we dragged the piano out or something. <laughs> but uh, I was playing piano at the time. She was playing guitar. And um, she's the one who actually taught me guitar. My, she gave me my first. Uh, couple of guitar lessons and um that's how i got the i i was bitten by the bug it's so it's so wild when we get our obsessions in life you know i was just mm -hmm. th when you were talking about that i was thinking about skiing you know i started skiing late late in life and uh you know a lot of my friends were really good at it and then all of a sudden i got the bug i mean i fell down the mountain the first uh the first time and tried to think right. of every excuse not to do it but what was nice about your early experience you uh, you're in I say somewhat of a friendly atmosphere because I'm assuming you know everybody on the front lawn, but then there's got to be that right. different pressure of, Hey, I know everybody, <laughs> you know, right. when you're playing, I don't know. Did you get the jitters or, you know, how did it go for you? 
Uh, it went well. I mean, we basically had uh, the neighborhood kids came around, and uh, I mean, I was a kid at the time. I was uh, probably thirteen or fourteen, something. Oh, like okay. That. Yeah, so you know, all the neighborhood kids kind of gathered around, and I remember Laura's mother used to uh, we used to play a whole lot of love by Led Zeppelin, and sure, and sure, the, and the middle section where you know you got the screaming and the uh, you know ah 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 all that stuff. And she would, it was just like the Frank Zappa, um, you know, um, what's what's the song? I can't remember the song, but where the, the ladies in the background going, turn it down. What do you guys <laughs> play something nice? You know. So oh, that's her, Frank Zappa, uh, Joe's yeah, Garage. Yeah. Joe's Garage, yes. Joe's, it was it was in Laura's Garage. <laughs> so, um, you know, her mother used to come out and go, play something nice, you know, and turn it down. It's too loud, you know. So, uh but those, those are the kinds, we did that, and we did some Chicago and Elton John and stuff like that. Nice. And hey, let's talk, let's talk about the song, What We'll Do, that our audience heard coming into the program. Tell me how, when when did you write it, and how did the muse strike you to write that particular song? Uh, well, I've been in a relationship for 43 years. And okay. after 43 oh years um, with the same person, um, at, you know, certain junctures in your relationship, you ask questions sure. about, you know, you sort of question things and, um, that's what the song is really about. Sort of how those questions can lead you astray. Um, but, uh, luckily for me, I was, a, I sort of course corrected and was able to get back on the same page so nice um you know you know you go through anyone who's been in a relationship for a long time you go through ups and downs and you know we feel really estranged from the from your partner and then you know and then things are going great so yeah yeah and you realize you know i'm glad i didn't blow this whole thing up um <laughs> right. and i stuck it out when things were not going so well so that's that's really what the song is about nice wonderful and, I guess I wrote it about a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, so it's going. Uh, it's going to be part of my next uh, album, putting together another album. Gotcha. Uh, now, are you going to do an album, or are you going to put out an EP? Because things seem to have changed as far as putting music out these days. Um, uh, so, yes, what are you? Well, what's your I, thought process? I have uh, about twenty-eight to thirty songs, new songs. Um, uh, so I guess I just can put it on an album. I mean, I'm old school. I'll probably print up CDs also to give out at um, shows or sell at shows. So um, nice. I like having the physical CD and you get the liner notes and that, that kind of stuff. And you can yeah. Whoever's on the, on the recording. So I can't really do that on Spotify and Apple and stuff like that. Right. And let's do this, Emmett. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I really want to get into how you approach the muse and what tips you might have for uh, some new singer songwriters or old singer songwriters like myself sure. out there. So, hey, everybody, hang with us. We're with Emmett. Attention, Hughes, music and lovers. Lots more to Long come. Island's we'll music right heritage is alive and thriving on the Long Island Sound podcast. Experience the rich tapestry of local artists. From classic rock to cutting edge sound. Don't miss a beat. Subscribe to the Long Island Sound Podcast on GigDestiny.com and immerse yourself in the melodic wonders of Long Island. Let the music carry you away. Hey everybody, we are back with Emmett Hughes and we just started get, getting into Emmett's background. And Emmett, I really want to talk about, and I know everybody does this differently, is how do you approach the muse? I mean, it seems like uh, you're very prolific in that you have all these songs uh, uh, in the locker, so to speak, ready to put out on an album. What, what's your process in how the muse strikes you and then how you develop it? Well, um, it can be uh, just a melody that's kind of reverberating in my head a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I often just walk around singing something and then I'll record it on my phone. So I have maybe 50 or 60 little snippets like that on my phone that I'll go to um, and and look for something that I'm, you know, when I'm trying to come up with something. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I also did a, um, a songwriting challenge for the month of February to write a song every two days, write, record, and uh, put out every two days, which was daunting to say the least. So what I, you know, I had maybe four or five songs that I was thinking about anyway. So I, I did those the first eight days and then I was like, Oh, what, what happens now? So basically what I did was I just was listening for a phrase or something that would get an idea rolling in my head. So I remember having lunch with a friend and he was talking about difficulties with his girlfriend and the relationship. And he, and he said, it must be me. And I said, mm. ah, perfect. It must be me. That's my next song. So I would go, go back to my apartment that night and, um, work on that, work on the song and come up with, um, you know, an idea around that. And it just seemed to flow. And once I did that, it was really hard to turn it off. I, um, mm. I remember lying on the couch, sort of half asleep watching basketball and, I had new songs popping up in my head. And I was like, no, stop. I have way too many songs. Um, you know, it's, it, it just becomes, uh, it sort of gets its own momentum. Yeah, it's like turn, turning the faucet on, right? And right, it right. And, and you have to just say, stop, enough is enough. I can't, I can't just keep writing songs. And Because, uh, I, honestly, the songs I wrote, I, they were good songs, but they needed tweaking. Maybe they needed a bridge or they needed you know, to fix the vocals up a little bit, that kind of thing. So uh, I have a lot of work to do to go back and uh, think about the production and uh, mixing and all that. So um, now that I have about 30 songs in the hopper, that's enough right now for at least, I would say, two or three albums. So, um, Wow. Let, let, should... let me Now tell me more about this. Was it just like a personal songwriting challenge you did or is something structured where you're kind of responding to somebody else. How, you know, tell me more about that. It was, it's a group called FAWM, F-A-W-M, and it's mm-hmm. an international songwriter group. And uh, a friend of mine told me about it. And so I joined it. And uh, basically you post your songs with the lyrics and then people react to it. Um, I don't know if it goes anywhere from there, but um, yeah, it was a really good experience for me. Um, and I could not believe that I finished uh, I actually finished two days early also because the, the last two or three days I wrote two or three songs in in one day. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a really good, it was a really good experience. I By would do way, it again. To, would yeah. you? Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. put, we'll put information uh, to FAM, you said, right? Um, F-A-W-M. F-A-W-M. Uh, we'll, we'll put information in the, uh, in the description down below. Uh, so people can check it out, along with links to uh, Emmett's uh, music as well. And I just want to throw a quick side note into our audience that if you're listening to this on Spotify and we have linked the music in, the artist actually gets credit. Uh, if you're a paid Spotify uh, user, you can hear the whole song. If you're a free uh, user, you're going to get pissed off because you're going to hear 30 seconds go, what the hell happened? <laughs> what the hell happened there? And I had a friend of mine call me, goes, I was listening. And I'm like, oh, that was cheap Pete, you know, because uh, <laughs> Pete didn't use the, the paid Spotify. So right. just just to kind of throw that out there. I want to expand a, upon that, that songwriting process in that I've spoken to guests who've uh, been purposeful of doing like a songwriting round where they'll say, okay, we've got five people here. Let's write a song about a window or whatever. And um, mm-hmm. they came back with a similar response saying, yeah, it was, it was fun, put pressure on you, and I would do it again. And I think it helps, helps your process, I would think, right? Yes, it definitely does. It definitely does. And you, yeah. um, you get more, uh, you explore more. You just, you know, you have to reach for things that you wouldn't normally do and you have to dig deeper and sort of uncover things that you forgot about. Um, I remember I was listening to, um, I was waiting to pick up my daughter from school mm-hmm. and I was listening to a George Michael song. Um, I will be a father figure. And okay. I didn't, I didn't really model my song after that, but it was just um, the production of it. Um, the mood of the song, I was like, mm, that's, that's kind of cool the way it was, it was done the, uh, you know, the, the way they mix the song and, uh, the arrangement and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, that kind of thing can sort of, um, 
you, you're sort of looking under and behind everything that you can when you're doing that because almost anything could be a song. You know, your dogs are barking and you're like, okay, there's, you know, sure. who let the dogs out? You know, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that uh, the way they wrote that song was something like that. The dogs are barking away and they said, who, who let the dogs out? They're like, okay, let's write a song about it. Yeah, there's a hook in there, right, exactly. Right, right. It's, it's, I, I tell you what's, what's interesting. Now, i got to ask you this question. My mind bops around. Is sure. Would you consider yourself, as far as writing music, a sole practitioner when it comes to fully structuring the song and then going to the studio? Or uh, have you also uh, worked in a collaborative effort where you maybe write the music or you do the lyrics, somebody else does the, the music? Um, what's your experience been over the years? Uh, mostly... I would say 98% of it, it's just me by myself. Okay. Because uh, I do I do still play piano, um, and I do play bass as well. So um, I'll sort of do most of the parts myself, and then I have a drummer, uh, a couple of drummers that I use regularly for recording, a couple of bass players. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, um, yeah, I could put most of it together myself, which is great. Uh, the one thing, though, uh, I have one of my, my youngest brother, he's 19 years younger than I am. Oh, wow. And he's so he's a completely different generation. And he's more of a hip hop kind of guy. Um, so we've collaborated on uh, a few things as well. And that's really has pushed me to do something completely different. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting how to me, how different genres approach the muse somewhat differently whether mm -hmm. it's uh, i've spoken to country music artists who have like a very deliberative structure on how they do a, a, a let's say a pop country song which mm -hmm. maybe that's you know i'm being redundant there that was a that was a slight of country music okay. my apologies um or or even hip-hop or somebody you know uh come you know hip-hop starts with the beat you know and then right. the line in in many cases and everything else is in all all different directions so i do notice in the video that i see some studio gear behind you so yeah. now in the structure of the song are you laying down the tracks yourself and the different parts or where, where does it go for emmett okay i've got the song I, I, this is how i want the bass to sound this is the drum sounds are you laying it down in your home studio and then where does it go from there is my question yes yeah, so usually um um it's interesting because most songs um, in the past, at least, um, I would write with my guitar or with a piano. I would just sit down at the piano and start figuring out chords or the guitar, and then I'd come with a vocal. But now that I have a recording studio, it's a very different process. Now I'll, um, I'll, I'll record a vocal, and then I'll say, okay, what are the chords that would go well with that? You know, what's the harmony that's going to support that what best? And then kind of figure that out. And then... You have so many, if anyone's got, you know, whoever's got a DAW at home, a digital audio workstation, you have a million choices from sitars to, um, you know, Andean flutes and all kinds of other things in, in between that you can pull from. So you're sort of just dropping in ear candy here and there and trying okay. to figure it out. And um, sometimes you use a loop. Uh, you know, sampled loop or something like that. So it really is, um, you sort of structuring it little by little by, you know, some of it's live playing, some of it sometimes is loops, and, and then I'll have a, a, a real drummer come in and do the, the drum part, you know, get rid of the, the looped drum or... Um, sure. You know, I, I use uh, live strings on my um, recordings for everything, so... Uh, hmm. I have a friend who plays viola and violin. Uh, I have a friend who's a cellist. I have my my nephew is a um, double bass player. Uh, oh yeah, I think I, I think I met him during the video recording. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, you know, I like to use live strings. I you know, I've uh, one song uh, that I have uh, live oboe and clarinet and strings and you know, but there's also timpani on there that I got from a software program. So. Yeah, you're kind of a mishmash of anything that's available. You know, take nice. a glass and tap on the glass if that sounds good. Yeah. So. Sure. So now, now you have the the, the full lay down of the the tracks. And excuse me, because I'm a real novice when it comes to it. I know a little bit. Yeah, no it makes me dangerous. Um, so now you have the tracks. Are you now 
Are you doing the final mix, or you is it moved to another process after that? No, I, uh, I I do mix a lot of it just so I could get ideas of how how to um, you know how I want it to sound at the end. Mm-hmm. But I I go to uh, Kevin Kelly, uh, oh, sure. the local guy, um, phenomenal uh, phenomenal mixer, uh, engineer, phenomenal bass player. He's a great musician. And um, he does my mixes for me. So my it's always, it's amazing. I went with my brother um, that I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. The first time I went there and uh, he pulled up a bass, a bass drum, a kick drum, and he started futzing around with it. And within a minute or two, my brother turns to me and goes, this is going to be worth every penny because the sound <laughs> was just so amazing. Um, and I, I'm fairly new at this. I mean, I've been doing uh, mixing and recording for about four or five years now. Okay. And he, but he's been doing it for 45 years or 50 years, something like that. So, right, right. You know, he's he's just, I'm never going to catch up to him. So. Yeah, well, um, you know, what's in, what I find interesting, and I found this through Mike Nugent as well, is having that, obviously, a, a very good musician has a very well-trained ear, but then there's that art of listening and finding other sounds to bring in to enhance the song per se Mm -hmm. you know you can write a great song and have a shitty recording (laughs) right that's pretty common or shitty mix let's say yeah and uh you know what's interesting to me as i'm getting into this musical world as a sidecar guy on it with a podcast is my experience with mike nugent who produces music and uses kevin kelly as well is when i step into mike's house and he's at the board He's like, oh, 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 come here, come, come, check this out, and this is what I did here, and 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 Mike's the most humble guy in the world, and I find it so fascinating about how he does it, and yet he's been a musician for a long time. He takes it and he hands it over to Kevin Kelly right. to do the final mix, and I asked him why is that because he goes, he's going to bring out stuff that I'm not hearing, or that you know is in his, his imagination that he can bring to mm-hmm. it, you know. It's I, a different. It, it's a different way of listening to the music. Also, it, it's yeah. you're listening to it as a um, not so much the individual instruments, uh, but you're listening to the overall uh, sonic wave. Yeah, yeah, the whole the whole thing. And where does this sit? And um, you know, how do you carve out using EQ and other things? You know, compressors and stuff. How do you carve out? a space for each individual thing so you can hear everything and how it has it all blend. Yeah. And that, it, that's really difficult. Yeah. What's interesting. I just, I just recorded, uh, another, uh, a young guy, uh, named Tyler Ransom. He goes to the new school in Manhattan. Jazz guitar is phenomenal. I mean, prodigy type guy, interesting story. And his first song started out with strings, which kind of blew my mind. And as I'm listening to it, and I'm thinking, I'm listening to a 21-year-old who just developed music, and it moved from strings to a hip-hop type of beat and then into jazz guitar. And it was just a very interesting flow or progression of this particular song that he wrote. It was just, um, that's why uh, music is so amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Let me switch gears a little bit here. Sure. About our next song, Uncle Bo John. Tell me about Uncle Bo John. Is he a real guy? <laughs> yes, actually, he is. Um, I, my father grew up in Alabama, and his brother, Uncle Bo John, um, he we met we met him a few times. Uh, you know, we went we drove to Alabama once with uh, had eight kids in my family, but at the time we had oh five God. kids, and my mother was pregnant. Um, oh, man. We drove all the way to Alabama and had to be, uh, had to be the summertime. It was the summertime. It was really <laughs> hot. It was great. I love, yeah, it was great as a kid. Um, sure. So, uh, every once in a while I get a phone call, you know, I would be at home at my parents' home and I, there was a phone would ring. I pick it up and I hear, and I'd be like, <laughs> Oh dad, it's uncle Bo John. Like I had no <laughs> idea what he was saying, but, uh, um, <laughs> So I um, I didn't really write this song about Uncle Bo John, but I wrote the um, it, it's a rap in it, um, and my brother does the rap. This is one of the collaborations. Oh, nice. But uh, yeah, it's sort of um, it's not the typical hip hop 
type of thing. It's more like a Beck kind of thing, or maybe even Gorillas, that kind of uh, vibe, to, vibe it. to it. Yeah. So, nice. um, and there's a line in there about uh, get your gr grits and eggs on like an Uncle Bo John. So, because uh, he used to cook us grits and eggs every day. So, um, <laughs> that's how it came to be. Nice. All right. Hey, everybody, let's listen to Emmett's song, Uncle Bo John. We'll be right back after the song. Hang with us, everybody. Exactly what was weighing down on my mind to depose what you shows is in your elbows, overdose and flows. Mm, comatose. Gone is your spawn, withdrawn and put on. Get your grits and eggs on like a Uncle Bo John. Come on and take on this mighty python, kicking corn dog breath and eating garlic. No. Eyes can't lie if they try Prying to your eye like a pie in the sky The princess in the pea ain't got nothing on me Lying kamikaze style with a chubby Pink champagne, explain your hind brain Complain but you still remain a house train Plain as day, nothing to say Cause you're straight DNA pump pump in your veins Cause you're straight DNA pump pump in your veins cool song Emmett and I like the fact that it's so different from the first song that our audience heard and that there was an actual person uh, that was in mind to a certain degree uh, about mm -hmm. the song and so that I, I love stuff like that and hey, I want to switch gears again because that's what I do I switch gears sure thing. <laughs> um, so uh, you were generous enough to invite me uh, to uh, a video shoot that you did that was only a couple miles from my my house in, in a in a what I would say is a nondescript studio and Mike Nugent played guitar. And I found, I found the process uh, it, really nice, really warm, nice atmosphere. It wasn't a type of video where, you know, we had people dancing because I went to a video shoot at uh, industry in, in uh -huh. <laughs> for, for Tony Tobias. And that was kind of a unique thing. And he's like, Oh, you want to dance in the crowd? I'm like, uh, no, uh, I don't want a video of me dancing. I know what I right. look like. I feel a lot different about how I dance when I'm dancing. Right. <laughs> Don't want it documented. So tell, tell me about, uh, you know, the songs you played, how you got it together, how you connected with the studio. I'm, I'm very interested in, in that process. You know, the guy who owns the studio is Mike Ars. The studio is called uh, Tone House Studios. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I I had a mixing console um, that was in storage for a long time, and the power supply went bad. So I took it to get it repaired, and the guy who did, does the repairs, he goes, uh, you know, we can't get this stuff anymore. I'll help you take it to the dumpster if you want, or <laughs> you could bring it to my friend Mike R's, and he'll sort of cannibalize the, you know, take all the knobs off it and sell those separately and and right. he'll, you know, he'll take a percentage, but he's a really honest guy, and he's a great guy to work with. And um, so that's what I did, and that's how I met Mike. And um, I have so I sold all of my old, I had tons of old gear that just wasn't, tech. you know, technology has gone, you know, yep. through the roof. I mean, even the stuff I have now is probably out of date um, compared to what's coming out now. So uh, I sold all my old stuff, you know, old digital audio tape and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, so I became really good friends with Mike, and he's been super generous with me. Um, mm-hmm. And he offered his space, he's got a uh, performance space in his studio to do a live video. And uh, a lot of clubs and uh, performance uh, spaces um, and even, um, you know, um, people who are doing the bookings and stuff like that, they don't want to hear a, a studio recording. And I, I and they, they're looking for a video. So um, I wanted to do something that looked more professional, but yet captured the, the live... Um, the live feel. Live of it, yeah. So uh, I didn't want like a, you know, a cell phone video of me playing in a bar with people talking and stuff like that. I, I wanted it to sound good, so... That's that's why we decided to do that, and I think it went really well. Um, like you said, it was a really good vibe, um, and the music I I think came out really good. Uh, my, yes. My, now tell me tell me who the musicians were because there was a great uh, pianist there as well and a drummer and who were the people that were involved in the studio? Yeah. So um, I was I was obviously um, singing and playing guitar. Mike Nugent was playing guitar and singing also. Mm-hmm. Um, my good friend, uh, Jay Betty, she goes by, uh, Jamie Barbarata. Uh, she was playing drums. She's been a friend of mine for probably 30 years. Okay. Uh, Larry Ketchell was on uh, piano and keyboards. And my nephew, Ethan Koenig, was on uh, upright bass and electric bass. Nice. Uh, nice. And my, and my good friend, Laura Press, that I mentioned before, I know since junior high school, was doing backing vocals. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, how did how did you find, or did you know of a video videographer that put it together for you, or? Yes, yeah, so, uh, my brother-in-law, Ethan's father, uh, okay. my brother-in-law Dan Koenig, uh, his friend John Miller is a professional videographer. So I uh, I contacted him. He said, "Yeah, it sounds great. I'd love to do that." So he came down and, and shot the video for us. Uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that you know you talk about what people you know video is playing. Obviously, we're doing a video podcast now. For those who are listening to audio, there's a video version of this, so you get to see my beautiful face, as my wife would say, the face for radio, made for radio. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's a joke. It's a crappy joke. Anyway, I'm an old. I'm an old dad. So I'm allowed. Uh, I'm allowed some leeway for crappy jokes on podcasts, but uh, it's interesting that video plays such a role in being a lure to attract people to the, the music, to the, to the audio. I have a friend of mine, uh, John Hamlin, who's a great musician. Uh, he lives in Nashville, lives probably there for about 20 years. And he switched careers uh, late in life to be a video producer. And he came out with a great video and he worked with a band. He owns the rights to the video. And I said, who's your audience? He goes, you're not going to believe it. It's very small. I'm I'm going to vid- I'm going to producers on Music Row, who want to do videos for bands, and that's my mm-hmm. that's my soul my sole audience. You know, I said that's interesting. You know, and you do have to have at least when you get into these expanded outside of a studio type of feel that you went for. Uh, if you go for more of the eclectic or art approach to the music, you need somebody with a great imagination who can pull it together, yes. and direct it and produce it. So that's, that's kind of interesting, you know, on, on yeah, that approach. And, and there's so much of that out there now. Um, I think somebody said something like every day there's 
200,000 videos or something put up on YouTube, some crazy number like that. And so yep. how do you cut through that noise is by, um, you know, doing something that's a little bit more special. So, Correct. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've got uh, guys who are and they they become good friends, the Como brothers. Um, who I, every time I hear them play, they sound like, because of the harmonies, they sound like the Everly brothers. You and I know who the Everly brothers are. Yes. <laughs> Younger people don't. But they, their process is uh, Tatiana is the fiance of Matt, and she'll shoot them with her iPhone 13 or 14, does a really great job. And what they do is every Sunday, like clockwork, 2 o'clock, they're putting out a video, and then they're following up with that same song with, the, with a similar video with the lyrics tied to it, mm. and they're taking the social media approach to it, you know, where they do an EP of three to five songs, and they're very prolific. And for their audience... It's almost that they have to do that. They have to keep boom things fresh and, and keep right. it going. And and that's right. you know professional musicians. That's their full time gig. So they they're very methodical about it. And I I look to them as as a great example of, of how to do it. And I've stolen ideas from them to advertise the podcast too. You know. So mm -hmm. um, hey, let's talk about the song. Tell you how I'm feeling. And let's have our audience listen to it. Just tell me. You don't necessarily have to tell me what it's about because I love to leave that to the imagination of the listener so that they mm -hmm. can own it. But tell me how it came about. How's that sound? Sure. All right. Tell me. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Go, Emmett. You're on. Okay. All right. Um, it came about, uh, once again, you know, thinking about relationships and um, trying to navigate through the minefield of uh relationships and um just sort of um knowing when to express yourself and when not to mm. you know so it's um you know sometimes you have to get it out and sometimes you have to just suck it up and that's really where it started um and that one starts with um strings and flute i have a live flute on that um and then sort of gets into the you know rock uh singer songwriter kind of thing after that but uh nice excellent um, yeah it's um my friend eric is on flute on that one i'm glad that i eric eaton, was, was eric eaton okay great excellent musician and uh just a genius and crazy 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 smart and um just he plays every instrument that i could think of brass woodwinds uh guitar bass drums keyboards uh, oh boy he's, he's great he's really great and nice. he's good at all of them all right he's gonna be the next podcast guest i'm sorry yeah yeah <laughs> this is this is the part of the podcast where i start guilting people that you mention who are definitely going to listen to your podcast yeah be ne next guest and I'll yeah I right. i'm sure he would like to do that Oh, we, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. We got a testimonial, so he's on. Yes. I will, <laughs> uh, I will put you in touch with him. Wonderful. I appreciate that. Hey, everybody, let's listen to Tell You How I'm Feeling. And when we come back, I want to talk about writing songs that are personal and how your local family reacts to it. Check out the song, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs> Left in the open Soaked by the rain Discarded for empty Nothing to explain Push to the sideline Your borders are so harsh Is that what I mean to you? Is that what this means? All out of options 
careful approach Crawl on my belly Stomped on like a roach Sent to bed early A hunger in my soul Is that what I mean to you? Is that what this means? I don't want to tell you how I'm feeling Or lock you in a cage Hide you in a tower Or play some losing game I don't want to tell you how I'm feeling In case the timing's off When giving all of me is not enough Thank you so much for that song. And as you were talking about the lead into that song about how when to speak and not to speak, when to show your feelings, what have you, you always think about that time of, yeah, I, I should have kept my, should have, would have kept my mouth shut right. <laughs> that time or, or, in, or reciprocally, I should have spoke up right. and, and, and said something in, in, in these Particularly charged times, you know, the approach on how we do things makes makes the difference. But I have a question for you. Sure. In doing that, in being, let me, let me take a step back. What I love about singer songwriters and artists who are very transparent with their music and put it out there. One, I'm amazed how I can connect to a song and say, "Wow, they really articulate." A situation that I went through, so now this becomes part of my soundtrack for my life, right. right? And and I'm enamored by that. That's that's kind of amazing. But now I have to ask you, as a songwriter, about the situations where a close family member or acquaintance may come out. Oh, you wrote you wrote that about our conversation, or when I was pissed off at you and we had that argument, 
Is that what that song is? Are you responding to that argument? I'm curious, has that happened to you? And, and I don't know, just, just tell me about it. It's just interesting where it can go, you know? Well, luckily for me, um, th- those kinds of situations have all been positive ones. So, okay. um, so for instance, uh, I wrote a song, Dark Bird, for my friend Doris, um, Doris Ar- uh, Arroyo. And she's a very dear friend of mine. And I wrote that for her 60th birthday. And um, she actually started crying when she heard it, which mm. is the best possible, uh, for me, the best possible response because I really hit her emotionally with it. So it was really, it was great. Um, but I remember, uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is kind of, I think this is funny. Um, a lot of my songs are about my my primary relationship with my husband your spouse right yep so um i i played him a song that i wrote about my sister who my sister committed suicide in 1984 right wow this is rough rough time so i wrote a number of songs about her but i wrote this one song and it, it you know it's you can tell it's about somebody who passed away and um so he i play it for him and he listens to it he goes what did i die and I said, no, not everything is about you. Like, <laughs> it's like right. I, not every single song is about you. It's you know there are other things I can write songs about. So um, I write songs you know about my daughter and um, you know and uh, with that songwriting challenge, I started writing songs that were more about you know sort of everyday things like you know things you find under your bed and that you forgot where they are or you're not even sure what it is anymore and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, um, it's, uh, yeah. I, I've been, I've been lucky getting back to your original question. I've been lucky that, um, it's been all positive, uh, responses to, um, songs that I write about people or situations. And, um, so everyone's been happy so far, I hope. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a different experience that I had. Okay, very first song that I wrote pub- and performed publicly, I did for my wife on her 50th surprise birthday party, which she told me, don't give me an effing birthday party, which I'm a risk taker. So I did. And it was a song called The Queen of My Dreams. And it was a satirical song directly about her that I had my nine-year-old daughter sing with me. Uh. <laughs> and I learned a lot. Uh, she she liked the song. Good. Uh, I think. I think. She didn't cry. Uh, I had tears in my eyes after she punched me in the face. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a couple of things in performing that live. One, I was nervous as hell. The amp didn't work that I was plugging. Uh, just everything that could go wrong went wrong. Another guy brought an amp in for me. And I started singing when the food came out for the buffet. Big mistake. And then I had my very interesting mother-in-law walk up to me while she's eating right in front of me and said, is this song about me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my that's God. the queen and of my dreams. Uh, and it's your mother-in-law. Wow, that's a little weird. Uh, yeah. 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 Kind of, kind of creepy. Yeah. A little creepy. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think about it. Oh my God. I, and I shared that with the world. Okay. So now, you know. So that's, yeah, it's it's funny, you know, especially when you have a spouse and, and you know, yeah, it's every other song I write about you, you know. Right. And I'd, I'd love to be the fly on the wall when they hear the song for the first time. And, well, I'm sure you get good feedback, you know, from your husband. So uh, Yeah. Well, we did, we actually did a song uh, called 40 Years, which was for our 40th anniversary. And we actually wow. did a duet on it. So he sings oh, really? part of it and then I sing the other part. Yeah. Is he a musician as well? He's a singer. He's a fantastic singer. Really, really great. Wow. I wish I could sing like he does. He's really right, great, right. Fantastic voice. Nice, excellent. So, so what's what's the future for you? So you have all these songs in 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 the closet here, so to speak, and that you're going to put out an album, which I think is great. What's next? Are you going to play out live, or do you gig out often? Or yes, or, you know, uh, I guess the, the summer's the summer's open for you, right? So, yes, um, I'm hoping so to do a lot of gigs this summer. Um, playing in town in Huntington um, in June, June third at Finley. Okay. Um, oh, nice. 
and looking at books some more stuff. I'd like to get into some of the festivals that are happening around. Um, I'm not really sure, um, you know, how exactly to get get there, but uh, yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on uh, trying to get out there and play more. Uh, well, yeah, yep. with the pandemic, I didn't play at all for a couple of years, and then uh, it's much more difficult doing it with a lot with a um, uh, an original band. And, uh, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, if I was doing covers, I could play, you know, three nights a week or four nights a week in the summer and play all over the place. And, you know, places would just hire you because you're playing, you know, stuff that they like. But, you know, it's sort of an unknown quantity when you're an original band. But luckily, I've been able to draw, you know, decent sized crowds. So, right. You know, I have a lot of connections between, uh, being a doctor in town for many years. And then, um, you know, my friends and family, um, mm -hmm. I have a nice connection, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a collection, I should say, of people that like to come down and see me. So, um, you know, that helps to be able to pack, yeah. pack in the, uh, people in the, in the room. So, yeah. Cause, cause any of any of the younger artists that I've talked to who approach a venue, uh, we approached one in New York City, this venue, and it's a pretty well-known guy, young guy. And they came back to him and say, yeah, if you can get three other acts with you, we'll consider you. And by the way, send me your Instagram, your TikTok, and you know, whatever social media, because guess what? They're looking at the audience size, and that's the metrics that they're using right. to say, are they can are we going to be able to sell tickets and make money off this guy, which is a business decision? Right. It's a, it's, it's ultimately is a business, and uh, you know, yeah. for, for me, I don't really I don't really care about the business side of it um, because you know I have a career and uh, I just want to get my music out. Um, the stuff that right. So you're 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 approaching it different. You're approaching yeah, it different. But yeah, certainly, if I was retired, I would be working on social media. Uh, pushing it on social media all the time, you know, just constantly out there. But I, you know, I have a limited time. I, I want to spend time with my daughter. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, as, as as we get as we get older and we don't have much time left, we, we kind of value. <laughs> yeah. What we're what we're doing, and you you kind of look at and say, yeah, maybe I'll put this aside for now because right. I need to focus and be present to so and so right, right. now. And that's whatever, why I don't want to do cover music either because. I just, I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to do my, yeah. my originals. Yeah, like I, I know that, um, so there's a festival coming up. Actually, I looked into the Montauk Festival. I heard different things about it that weren't so good. Um, and then there is a festival in September in Sag Harbor that's pretty good with uh, music. And then Mike Nugent's going to actually play at the Long Island Music and Entertainment Hall of Fame. Uh, it's a free thing that, that, different bands do mm -hmm. to attract people to the new hall of fame in Stony Brook. And it's uh -huh. on a Sunday afternoon and you play for an hour and they have a nice stage set up and, uh, uh, they actually have an exhibit of all the old clubs from Long Island back in the day. Wow. My father's place, the OBI, they have right. uh, a little thing set up. It's pretty cool. So right. they're, they're depending upon the wellspring of talent on Long Island to help it attract it. So that might be something right. to look into. Hey, I, I want to kind of round back to, the fourth song that you brought to the table called Dark Board, Dark Bird. Bird. Mm -hmm. It's like, get the marbles out of my mouth. And this is totally different than the other songs. So Completely tell me different. a little bit about it. Yeah, tell me about it and let's uh, let the audience have a listen. Sure. I um, I mentioned this earlier. This is a song I wrote for my uh, friend Doris. Um, Did I meet Doris at the video shoot? No, she wasn't there. Oh, okay. Was my friend Aranda okay. was there. Um, okay. Doris was there, and uh, Doris was not there. Doris, it was Doris's 60th birthday. That's the, the song I wrote for her, and um, it started with the beginning melody, which is done on oboe actually. And um, mm. I just started with the melody, and it just took off from there. And um, um, I'm really happy with the way it came out. I mean, I'm thrilled that it moved her so much to cry. So that that's great. Um, and uh, I think the performances on them are, you know, really good also. So I'm, I'm happy with it. All right. So now i got to prep the audience. Get, get the tissue box ready. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> let's have a listen to Dark Bird.
Hey, everybody, we're back. Emmett, it's been a real pleasure having you on the podcast on the show today and to get your perspective on on how you develop the muse and how you approach music and how you uh, tie it into your life and be very transparent with your feelings and, and putting it into the music and how you've gotten so prolific for it. I think we found out a lot of tips on uh, for musicians on how to approach uh, music. So I thank you for that. And I, I really thank you for your time on spending time with me today. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure and uh, I'm glad to do it. And I'm, uh, I'm very thankful that you asked me to do it. All right. So now you got to spread the gospel of the Long Island Sound out to your buddies. Okay. <laughs> and out to the world. And uh, thanks so much. And everybody, uh, check out Emmett Hughes. You'll find him in the description below. Uh, and his music, and there's a lot more to come from Emmett. So until next time, peace, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time you spent with us. Please subscribe and comment and visit us at gigdestiny.com. Until next time, be generous with your joy, keep your spirits high, and let the music take you on a journey. Be well. Peace. Peace.